we start, I'd like to pray with you one more time. And we've got to get this thing to go in again. Now, once again, Father, before we open this book, we pray that your Spirit would open our minds and our hearts to the Word of God, the precious Word of God. Bless us now, Lord, as we seek an understanding of your Word and your will for our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In Exodus chapter 14... In verse 30, we read these words. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead upon the seashore. Can you imagine what a ghastly, gruesome sight that must have been? There they lie, these soldiers of the once proud army of Egypt. They're in all sorts of positions, these dead men. Some of them have their, their arms pillowed peacefully, their heads pillowed peacefully upon their arms as if in sleep. Others lie prone upon their backs with bits of seaweed in their hair and their sightless eyes staring in terror at nothing. Uh, they're all much, very much alike, these corpses. But uh, here's one that's different. Look at the rich costume in which this, this corpse is dressed. Ah, oh. Look at his jeweled, bejeweled fingers. Uh, there's no crown upon that brow at this time. There's no scepter in that nerveless hand. And yet it's easy to guess that this corpse, this pocket that death has turned inside out and emptied, was once a king. Well, yes, this is the body of Pharaoh Thutmose III, the one-time ruler of Egypt. But here he lies today, hidden among the meanest of his soldiers, buried in the sand at the bottom of the, of the, red, of the red Sea. And now comes the big question that we want to consider today. How came this famous Egyptian to be lying here? He was once a king, you remember. He was ruler over the proudest nation in the world at that time. And yet here we find him today dead. He died away from his palace. He died a violent death. His body lies rotting in, in, in the sand of the Red Sea, never to be found and buried. So let's hold a little inquest over him this morning to see how he came to die. Now, he didn't leave his palace in Egypt and march into the Red Sea for that purpose. I'm quite sure that he never intended that his life should end here. And nor is he here because his enemy Israel has proven stronger than himself. So what then is the cause? Well, the question is answered by the voice of God. We find that answer, we read it here in Exodus chapter 9, verse 16. For this cause have I raised thee up, that I might show forth my power in thee. Hmm. You notice what that strange text is saying there? You, you notice that? Without the least bit of equivocation... This text is saying that God raised this man Pharaoh up that he might show forth his power in him. And that, that power, that purpose, he has accomplished. And this ghastly piece of royal rottenness has not been thrown into this sea by the hand of men. As we look at him, we see in him a monument of the power of God. And strange to say, he's not a monument of God's power to save and to keep and to utilize, but of God's power to tort and to disappoint and to wreck and to destroy. And in his destruction, God tells us that he's achieved his purpose. Whoa. Now, I wonder what old Mike Klute does with that one. You know Mike Klute? That, that's the guy that's over in Texas that, that wrote that, that God doesn't punish the wicked. Uh, that, uh, that even Satan's going to get away with this stuff, you know. Now, you will agree with me that this is a rather amazing statement here in Exodus 9. Wouldn't you say that? The teaching seems to be that God has raised this man up, this man Pharaoh, that he might glorify himself by making a complete and utter wreck of himself, a wreck of the, of the man. Now, I wonder if that could be true. Hmm? 
We will agree, all of us, I suppose, who believe the Bible, that God has a purpose, God has a plan for every life, right? Okay? All nature tells of a plan in God. I mean, you look at the universe out there and the order and, and, this, and, and look at the solar system and the precision and the sh- of all the planets circulating, circulating, uh, circling the sun and the, and the moon's orbiting. And, and you can look at the, the human body and, and, and you can see all the, all the systems that are dependent upon one another. And it's a, an amazing miracle, this body of ours. All revelation tells of it also. We have the message direct from the lips of the Lord Jesus Christ. As my Father has sent me, even so send I you. But in admitting that God plans every life, can we believe that he plans for one to become a Judas and the other to become a St. John? Hmm? Is it the purpose of God that one shall develop into a Moses... And the other, right at his side, shall grow up into a miserable, miserable, distorted wreck that we call Pharaoh. Hmm? Now, that's what John Calvin taught, you see. See, John Calvin taught that God predestined one group to be saved and another group to be lost. This group over here was going to be saved, that group over there, and you didn't have any choice in the matter. If you were born in this group... You're okay if you're born in this group. Well, that's too bad. But is that true? No. In other words, is Judas as much a part of God's plan as was John? Well, if so, then, listen now. That's a trick question because if that's true, then we, we of all people are most miserable because we have a wicked God. But that's not the case. We know that's not the case. Because God never planned that anyone should go wrong. In fact, we have it from Him. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to everlasting, to come to understanding of Him and have everlasting life. Come to repentance. So we know that's not really the case. God's the eternal lover. God loved Moses, but He loved Pharaoh no less. And Judas was just as much a part of God's, uh, just as dear to God's heart as was John. I mean, look at how long and how hard Jesus Christ worked with this man, Judas Iscariot. For three and a half years, he worked with Judas. Okay? And hear me now. Whatever failure they made of their lives... And whatever failure we make, whatever failure you and I make of our lives, we do not make it because God forces us to do that. Because God forces us to do so. In whatever way we go wrong, we do not do so because God planned that we should. That's not the case. We don't go wrong because God planned that we go wrong. Mm. We do it because of our own willful, wicked rebellion. And Though God plans your life and mine, He cannot in the very nature of things force us to enter into His plan. All right? He can't force us to enter into his plan. Now, and, 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 and so, listen to me. Though Pharaoh lies here, listen to me. Now, but, but let me back up here just a moment. It, how, do we strain, how do we explain this strange thing? You, see, you who are... You who are fathers and mothers know this is true. That we can't force people into our plan. Many of you who are parents have made beautiful plans for your children, right? Only to have those plans despised. Because our children are not ourselves. They're not clones of ourselves. They have independent wills. 
They have the capacity for entering into our purposes for us and thus bringing us joy unspeakable, but they also have the capacity for despising those plans and, and just breaking our hearts. And many times they do, don't they? So how then do we, how do we explain this strange text? For this cause have I raised thee up that I might show forth my power in thee. Because you see, it is a fact that this death here in the Red Sea was not an accidental death. It was not. It is a fact that this corpse hidden among his soldiers here is not here by chance. It's a fact that this body of Pharaoh is rotting in this Red Sea, not at all by an accident, folks. This king was flung here by the power of a disappointed and grieved and rejected God. Now, you got that? He lies here hidden among his soldiers, mean soldiers, according to the deliberate plan and purpose of God. But while that is true, listen to this. While that's true, we need to keep this big fact in mind. That though Pharaoh lies here according to the purpose of God, this was not God's first and highest purpose for him. That wasn't God's original plan for the man. But you see, Pharaoh resisted and resisted and rejected and rejected every noble and worthy and worthwhile purpose that God had for his life. And God cannot, in the very nature of things, force us to enter into his plans. And so by his own wicked rebellion, Pharaoh has made it impossible for God to realize any purpose in him at all except the worst and the last. Do you remember that little story over there in Jeremiah 18 about Jeremiah being told to go down to the potter's house? Some of you may be remember, but I see some blank looks out there, so let's warm this thing up a little bit here. Uh, in Jeremiah, God told... You see, one day the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, the prophet, saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house and hear my word. There I will hear, cause you to hear my word. And so Jeremiah went down to the potter's house and uh, he heard the message. And when Jeremiah went, arrived in, within the potter's house, three things immediately caught his attention. They drew his attention there. See? First of all, there was the man working. That was the potter. Then there was the instrument with which he worked. That was the wheel. And then there was the substance upon which he was working, and that was the clay, see? All right, got this picture now? Picture's worth a thousand words, isn't it? In the potter's hand, the clay was misshapen and unsightly. Now, let me explain something to you about this wheel. See, it wasn't just one wheel. Really, it was two wheels conducted by a chef. They were sitting there flat like this, not rolling along. They were sitting like this. And... The upper wheel was connected by a shaft to the bottom wheel, and that potter could sit on this little stool back here, see, and he could, and there was a framework out here supporting these wheels, and he could put his feet on that bottom wheel and turn the bottom wheel, and that would spin the top wheel, see, because it was conducted by the, the, by the shaft. And so when he put that blob of clay up there on the wheel, it would be spinning, and he could work it with his hands. Got the picture? That's what's happening there. All right? Now, in the potter's hand, this clay is misshapen. It's unsightly. All right? <clears throat> now, the cup wasn't yet finished in the, potter's, in the potter's hand. There was a place, however, where the cup was finished. And that was in the mind of the potter. You see, the potter could already see the finished product, product that he was trying to make here. He was trying to make that cup according to a plan. He's trying to make that cup according to the ideal that he had in his mind, see? 
But as we read the text here, it says that the cup was marred in the making. That is, there was something in the clay that resisted the hand of the potter. Understand? Now, what did he do with that marred cup? We would have expected him to just throw it away, right? But he didn't. Jeremiah 18, verse 4 says that he made it again. Man, you think about that. What a gospel that is for failing, sinning men and women. When we fail over and over again. That's marvelous, isn't it? When we resist God's purpose and all but wreck ourselves, He'll make us again. He begins again to shape us and to mold us and to make us. But only as we yield to His touch. Only as we yield to His touch. Truly we would be a hopeless race, but for the fact that we have a mighty God who is is able to remake us, even when we have rebelled against him and have thwarted his purposes for us. He made it again. Ah, yes, but notice this. He made it again, another vessel. Another vessel. You see, he realized that he could not make it according to the fine ideal that he had in his mind for the first vessel. So he made it in a second. You see, God has a plan for your life. A best plan, an ideal plan for your life. And when you reject that, when you resist that, then God has to fall back on plan B. And when you mess that up, he falls back on plan C. <laughs> and when you mess that up, he falls back on plan D. Hopefully nobody's on plan Z. Hopefully. You see? God has plans, and he keeps on working with you. God is the great hound of heaven. He doesn't let you go. <coughs> you take yourself out of God's hand. Not the other way around. Understand? So that potter realized he couldn't make it to the according to the fine ideal. That one refused to realize the best, and therefore he made it again in another vessel. He sought to make it realize the second best. Now, there's a truth, folks. There's a truth of tremendous importance here in this, 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 this idea here that we're prone to forget. And that truth is this, that having rejected and rejected and resisted and resisted God for days and months and months and years, that God cannot make of us what He could have made if we had entered into his plans from the very beginning. You, you see, if you reject God's best for you, thank you, I needed that. Appreciate that. See, if you reject God's best for you, then he tries to get you to realize the second best. And if you reject that, he seeks to bring the next best. But remember this, God cannot make as much out of a half of a life as he can out of a whole of a life. It's just that simple. Now, <clears throat> suppose that the clay upon which this potter was working had been marred again. Well, again, the potter would have sought to make it into another vessel. But all the while, now listen, <clears throat> this is what's important. All the while, while he's seeking to make it into another vessel, all the while, that clay would have been becoming less and less pliable and less and less plastic because it would be drying out. See? It would be harder and harder to shape it and to mold it. But the human clay, the human clay is also... You see, God is the divine potter. God is the divine potter, you see. God, it says in Jeremiah 18, verse 6, Cannot I do with you, O house of Israel, as this potter, saith the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in mine hand, O house of Israel. See, 
God's a divine potter. But the human clay is becoming less and less plastic and less and less pliable. Every time we foul up, see? And thus the time would inevitably come when it would no longer be capable of being worked by the hand of the potter. And then what would happen? What would be the result from that? Well, if you, in the illustration, if you step outside the potter's house, you're in the potter's field, and there about you lie broken bits of crockery and broken earthenware, uh, shattered earthenware. And why is it there? Why is it there? Not because the potter made these vessels for the stupid purpose of breaking them to bits and pieces and throwing them out in the trash pile. They're there because there was something in the clay that so resisted the hand of the potter that he was able to make nothing of them but these shattered and misshapen and broken wrecks. Now, this is the story of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. This is the story of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. God had a noble purpose for that man's life to begin with. And he gave him every opportunity to conform to that plan. He brought to bear all that infinite mercy and, and love and power and, and could bring to bear, to get Pharaoh to be a good man, see. And the reason that Pharaoh ended as he did was not because God did not love that man and, and do his infinite best to try to save that man. <coughs> it was because Pharaoh resisted and resisted and rejected and rejected till at last he threw himself a corpse into the Red Sea. Because you see, folks, while it's true that it says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart, there's also just as many texts that says Pharaoh hardened his own heart in the book of Genesis. God has a plan, and you resist that plan. God, has, God, can't, God can't do with you what you won't let him do. Let me say something else. Do you know that it's a much, much greater miracle for God to save you than it is for God to heal you? You know why? Because in order for God to save you, in order for God to, 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 to turn you into that beautiful thing that he wants you to become, you have to cooperate. He has to depend on you. But to heal you, they can just, Jesus could say, be healed, and that's it. And I've seen him do some wonderful things like that, too. It takes a greater miracle for God to save a person than it does to heal a person. And the message that we would get from this story right here this morning, the message we would hear from Pharaoh if his, from that, those clammy lips, if they could speak to us this morning, would be this. Look at me and see what a terrible thing it is to rebel against God. Behold me and see the tragic failure of the man who persistently throws himself in wicked madness against the purpose and the hand and the power of God in his life. Now, I want you to look with me for just briefly for just a moment here how hard God tried to make something out of this man, Pharaoh. In the first place, God gave him a great and faithful minister. Pharaoh had the privilege of knowing Moses. He had the opportunity of listening to about the greatest individual that the world has ever seen aside from Jesus Christ. Listen to me, folks. Uh, Moses, he had the opportunity to listen to Moses. Moses, Moses could have been Pharaoh. Moses could have had a position of power and greater, of, of influence greater than that of Daniel or Joseph. He could have been Pharaoh. But it wasn't God's purpose for him. <clears throat> it wasn't God's purpose for him to kill that Egyptian. It wasn't God's plan for him to kill that Egyptian. And when he did that, he strayed from God's plan. He threw that away. 
that first plan when he killed. But Moses could have done marvelous things for God as Pharaoh, perhaps even greater than Daniel or Joseph. But he threw that away. But yet, God realized his second best in Moses' life, and Moses turned out to be a leader par excellence, didn't he? Oh. God spoke to Moses face to face after 40 years of tending sheep. But how many times, listen to me though, how many times have you thrown away God's best and God's second best and God's third best? How many new beginnings has God given to you? You know, at the beginning of every new year, we, we make these resolves that we're going to do it different, we're going to do this better, we're going to do this and that and the other, whatever better, you know. After, how many of those resolves we keep? After every communion service, you know, we promise God we're going, to, we're going to follow Him a little bit more closely, you know, more closely, and so on and so forth. How many of those resolves do we keep? Pharaoh knew Moses. He had the opportunity of listening to about the greatest man that ever lived, but Pharaoh threw himself away. I want you to get that. Pharaoh threw himself away. Now, you may not have had a great teacher like Moses, but you've, had, you've been warned, see? And in your sin, you're without excuse. God gave Pharaoh a chance to cooperate with him and, and to help him in, in saving Israel and making her into a great nation, folks. Now, what were Moses... What, were, what was God's first words to Pharaoh through Moses? What was God's first words through Pharaoh? Or to, to Pharaoh through Moses? God said to Pharaoh, The Lord God of Israel saith, Let my people go. And what was Pharaoh's answer to that? It was rather haughty, wasn't it? He said, who is the God of Israel? I do not know him. And indeed, he didn't know him at that time. But he had every, he might have known him. But God, the potter, didn't throw him away after that first chance, did he? No, quite to the contrary, he gave him ample opportunity to know him. And with this end in view, he, God brought his infinite energies into play and wonder after wonder and marvel after marvel, he worked in the presence of Pharaoh by the hand of Moses. Now remember this. These wonders, these ten miracles, the, those ten plagues that fell upon the Egyptians were directed against the false idols of Egypt the false gods of Egypt. They were directed against the idols that Pharaoh and the Egyptians worshipped, folks. God was sending Pharaoh a message. He was sending Pharaoh and Egypt a message. Through those plagues. But at first... These wonders, these miracles were imitated by the Egyptian magicians, weren't they? Uh, Satan's imps. I mean, they, these fakes, these phonies by their cunning made it easy at least for a while for Pharaoh to resist God. They helped that king close his eyes to the truth and they helped him to start on a decision that put him on a course of rebellion. But the magicians were soon outdone, weren't they? And God, through Moses, began to perform wonders that they couldn't imitate and they couldn't duplicate. And finally, they themselves were soon forced to believe in the presence and the might and the power and the reality of God. Now, how do I know that's true? Because they who had helped their king to go wrong finally had to turn to him with this acknowledgement on their lips. This is the finger of God. This is the finger of God. But you know something? It's always easier to lead a man astray than it is to lead him back again once you've led him astray. And it's easier for you, by your godless life, to lead your children away, astray than it is to lead them back again after you've led them astray. 
it's easier for you to lead someone out there you work with astray than it is for you to lead them back after you've led them astray. That's why, folks, lifestyle is so important. See, Pharaoh listened to God. When the, I mean, he listened to the magicians. Pharaoh listened to the magicians when they counseled him to do wrong. But he turned a deaf ear to them when they counseled him to do right. And then followed the rest of that series of plagues that fell upon the Egyptians and their idols. Now listen, each one of those plagues was directed, it was, always, it was directed against an idol, but it was always preceded by and followed by this demand of God spoken through the lips of Moses. What was that demand? Let my people go that they may serve me. Now, do you see what God was demanding of Pharaoh here? It's the very same thing that he's demanding of you and me today. Obedience. Plain, simple obedience. That's all. He's commanding us to surrender ourselves to him. He's commanding us to enter into His purposes for our life. You see, if you are to be His child, now you follow me carefully for a moment. If you're to be His child, you must be obedient. You must keep His commandments, all ten. But more than that, you must keep His law of love. You must accept Jesus Christ as the Lord of your life. And unless He is the Lord of your life, then He's not really your Lord at all. Unless He has the first place in your life, He's not your Lord. Do you understand something? Listen, salvation is free. Salvation is free to all. Anyone who will may come and accept Salvation. But discipleship is costly. Discipleship is costly. Jesus Christ himself said, No man is able to be my disciple except he's willing to forsake father, mother, brother, sister, whatever. Discipleship is costly. See? So while salvation is free... Discipleship is God. And the one thing, listen, the one thing that God wanted was the one thing that Pharaoh didn't want to give. But he was becoming afraid. And so he proposed a compromise. In his fright, he tells Moses that he will obey. He says, I will let the people go. That is, he said, I will let part of them go. I will let the children go. Leave, I will let, I'll let the men and women go. Leave the children in Egypt. I'll let the men and women go, leave the children here. You think about that. Pharaoh wasn't exactly stupid, was he? He knew that just as long as he kept those children in bondage, <laughs> Israel would remain in bondage. How many of you would be willing to go off and leave your children? Ah, uh, no. And the devil knows perfectly well today that just as long as our homes remain unchristianized, just as long will the world remain unchristianized. I want you to think about something. Folks, our country is becoming an absolute cesspool. The world and our country is becoming an ab... It, it, it's becoming a, a, a sewer. Follow this for a minute. Think about this for a minute. Think about the history of this particular issue for the last, say, 50, 60 years. In the middle 1950s, it was absolutely unthinkable for a person to, to admit that he, had, he was a sexual deviant. They wouldn't even think about admitting that. But today, in this country, the majority think it's okay. It's an acceptable alternative lifestyle. Why was Sodom and Gomorrah destroyed? One of the primary reasons was for that. But you know something? You have to be careful how you talk about that today because preachers 
are yanked off and put in jail for saying those things about that kind of thing. Why is this, why have we come to this state of affairs? Why is this, why has it gotten to this point? Because of what we allow to go on in our homes. We have allowed the media to educate our children. We have allowed Hollywood and the television and the movies and, and the video games and, uh, and what have you to educate our children. And we will never bring in the kingdom of God simply by seeking to serve, to save, uh, to, to serve an adult generation. Oh, we have to serve, we have to seek the adults, but we have to give God a chance to the children. That's why I'm so glad to see all these kids in this church today. Amen. But you know what? We are, you know, something you need to think about is this. If at all possible in every church, now I know it's a struggle for small churches to do this, but in every church, if it's at all possible, every church ought to have an adventurer club. That's for the little guys. And a pathfinder club. And a church school. If at all possible. You ought to have something for those kids. But then Pharaoh offered a second compromise. He said, I will let you and the children go, but you must leave your cattle, you must leave your sheep, you must leave your, your flocks and herds in Egypt. In other words, what's he saying here? That is, you may go into Canaan if you must, but you leave your business in Egypt. <laughs> and the devil is perfectly willing that you and I be just as pious and prayerful as we want to be on Sabbath morning, provided we forget about all about such things, on Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, and all this, so on so and so forth. And you know that's true. You know it's true. The devil is perfectly willing for you to be devoutly religious if you will just confine your religion to this building, to this church. He's willing for you to scrupulously keep nine commandments if you just break one. And I'm not just talking about the Sabbath commandment either. But I am talking about that too. He's willing for you to worship God on Sunday when you know perfectly well that Saturday is the seventh day Sabbath because you are afraid you're going to lose your job. Because you know something? The devil knows perfectly well that you're not trusting God in that case. But a religion that doesn't permeate and purify and uplift and sanctify every aspect of the life, including business and business relationships, is not the religion of Jesus Christ. Because Christ is not on the throne of your heart. But then Pharaoh offered a third compromise, and he said, I will let the people go, but they must not go far. And why did he say that? For the very simple reason he wanted the privilege of getting them back again. And he wasn't really letting them go at all, was he? He wasn't really letting them go. He was saying, for instance, I will, let, I will obey God, but I don't want to promise to make my obedience permanent. <laughs> now, we've seen, we've seen plenty of instances of that, right? Right? Think about that now. Here's a man who has decided to be a Christian, but he won't join the church. He won't join the church. He wants to see, you know why? Because he wants to see how he's going to get along first. He wants to see if he will have Sabbath work problems. He wants to see how this thing is going to sit with his friends and his family and so on and so forth. But you know what's going on there? That person is making provision for going back again. The Lord said to the paralyzed man that he had just healed, take up thy bed. He wants us to make a break with the past, complete break. And when we do that, he helps us because we trust him. And when we trust him, he helps us, see? Oh, yes, indeed, folks. Pharaoh wanted to compromise. But the plagues grew worse and worse and worse than worse. And while the scare is on, he promises over and over again that he will obey the Lord. 
But did he promise unconditionally? No, he did not. Now, what is that teaching you there? What is this thing teaching, this story of Pharaoh? What's it teaching you? It's teaching you this. You cannot play games with God. That's what it's teaching you. You cannot play games with God. You dare not play games with God. It will be a thousand times better to obey God now. It'll be a thousand times better to surrender to God now. It will be a thousand times better to walk with God now than to wait until the plagues begin to fall. And I'm talking about the seven last plagues. You know why? Because if you wait till the seven last plagues begin to fall, it's going to be too late. Why? Because when that first plague fa falls, probation is already closed. Probation closes somewhere between the National Sunday Law and that first plague. Pharaoh played games with God. He promised to obey when the scare was on, over and over again. But when the plague was lifted, he backed off his promise. But look at how patient, how patient God was with this man, Pharaoh. Look at how patient he was. You know, we're absolutely amazed at how patient God was with this man, Pharaoh, until we realize, until we think about how patient he was, with, how infinitely patient he's been with each of us. By storm, by black night, black night. You know, it was dark for three days in Egypt. You know why? Because they worshiped the sun. By storm, by black night, by adversity after adversity, God was doing his very best to fight Pharaoh back from that Red Sea. He was doing all he could to turn that man away from committing suicide, both spiritual and physical suicide. But Pharaoh, just like some today, seemed absolutely greedy for damnation. He seemed bent on working out his own utter destruction. And after the king had brought, and he'd broken one vow after another, and, and after he had lied and lied and lied again, God finally brought that last dark providence into his life. He made one final effort to save the man from utter ruin. Remember the morning after the night of the Passover. Passover, that was when the, the Lord came and told Moses to tell the children of Israel to slay a lamb and take that lamb and take the blood from that lamb and take a, some hyssop and sprinkle that blood over the doorpost, the lintel of the house. Every house in Egypt, every, every, children, every child of, of, of the children of Israel, every house, every, every house of the children of Israel, they were supposed to have that blood. And they were to eat that lamb in, in, the, in the house that night. Eat it with their clothes on and their shoes on, ready to travel. And then the, that night, the destroying angel came to Egypt and destroyed the firstborn child of every home that didn't have that blood. And so the morning after the night of Passover, ah, uh, when the destroying angel had already passed through Egypt, Pharaoh was called upon to kneel by the coffin of the firstborn, the crown prince. And his hard heart seemed softened at last. And by the grave of the crown prince, he made a solemn vow that he was going to obey God at last. He was going to obey. And he set about putting that vow into obedience at once, in execution at once. And the children of Israel were not only allowed to leave Egypt, but they were hurried out of Egypt. They were given all kinds of, of boot, of, I mean, booty and loot to go along with their freedom. Given all kinds of gold and jewels and whatever. Hurry, get out of here. At last, at long, long last, with what infinite expense this man has been brought to obey. But would you believe it? Would you believe it? 
the grass had not yet grown green under the grave of the crown prince till he forgot all about his vow and he turned back to his old tricks again. <laughs> Think about that. Oh, what a grip sin gets on us. How blind we become when we persistently refuse to follow the light and God's leading. And so Pharaoh brushed the tears out of his eyes and he gathered his army together and he set out after the departing children of Israel. And can you picture this? Can you picture the hustle and the bustle of them in the hurry of getting ready, to getting, setting out, harnessing up the chariots, getting all this mess together? Can you see the look of hate on that king's face as he comes within sight of his one-time slaves? And can you see him laugh a cruel laugh when he sees their predicament? They're shut in on every side. Man, there are mountains on either side of them. He, the sea is behind them, and my, their sea is in front of them, and my, my army's in behind them, and uh, they're shut in. Oh, what sweet revenge he's going to have, he thinks. But wait a minute. Wait a minute now. Something strange has happened here. Path has opened up through the Red Sea. God's performed a miracle here. The, these hunted slaves, they're marching in. Ah, but it doesn't make any difference where Israel can go. My army can go just as well. And so he and his army rush in right behind them. And they keep right after those Israelites. Oh, wait a minute now. Wait now. The Israelites are all on the other side. They have reached the high ground. And then there's a shriek of terror that's quickly choked. The waters have come together again. And the sea waves roar about these struggling Egyptian soldiers like liquid hate. The king is forgotten. The men are madly trying to save themselves. A the jeweled hand flashes in the air for just a moment. There's an oath, a cry for help, a gulp, and then there is silence. Silence. Because the hungry sea has its prey. Pharaoh, why are you here? And if those dead lips could speak, he would say, I'm here because I persistently refuse to obey God. He offered me the best, the very best, but I spurned it, and I spurned it again and again and again until at last he threw me here. He did it because I made it impossible for him to do anything else but but I want you to think with me for just a moment. As I look at this, you know, as I look at this wreck, I think about how differently the story might have ended. How differently. Because this man might have had a part in the making of a great new nation. He might have been associated with Moses in giving the world a new nation. He might have one day enjoyed the fellowship of Moses and the earth made new. Because you see, now listen to me carefully, because you see the difference between this man Pharaoh and the great man Moses is not in the fact that God purposed evil for the one and good for the other. The difference between them is not even in that one never disobeyed and the other did disobey. That's not true at all. The difference between them is this that one was finally obedient to the heavenly vision, and he could say, the grace that was bestowed upon me was not bestowed in vain. The grace that was bestowed upon me was not bestowed in vain. But that other one, Pharaoh resisted and resisted and kept on resisting until he ran by every roadblock that God could throw in his path until he plunged headlong finally into utter destruction. Man, what a tragedy. What a tragedy. What might have been here? Now, God is asking each of you this morning for obedience. God is asking us for obedience. God says, look at my son. He was obedient. 
even to the death of a cross. He was obedient even to the possibility of eternal separation from me. He was obedient. And he did all of that for you. He was obedient. Will you be obedient to me? That's what he's saying. Will you be obedient to God and his son today? What he's asking you to do is, will you put me on the throne of your heart? He's saying, will you put Jesus on the throne of your heart? Will you stand with me this morning saying, yes, Lord, I want a new beginning? Will you? Stand right now and say, Lord, I give you what's left of my life. Use it, if you will, to advance your kingdom, your cause in this earth. Stand with me this morning. Let's make a covenant with the Lord right now that we will do our very best every day to put Jesus on the throne of our heart. We're going to sing our closing hymn in just a moment, Trust and Obey. But there's another little song that I have learned that I want you to learn the words of. And you can repeat this every day. And it'll help you along the way. You know what it says? It says, Father God... Let me sing it for you. Father God, just for today, help me walk your narrow way. Help me stand when I could fall. Give me your strength to hear your call. May my steps be worship. May my thoughts be praise. May my words bring honor to your name. May my steps be worship. May my thoughts be praise. May my words bring honor to your name. Father, as we close this service today, we give you an opportunity to change us, reach down into our lives and change the gears. And help us to realize that you want to you want to do something special with our lives, but so we give you what's left of our lives, and we hope that there's some plans left out there for, for each, and one, each, each and every one of us, that you will take us and mold us and make us and teach us what you want us to be and help us to be what you want us to be. And as we sing this closing hymn, Trust and Obey, we pray that you would help us to have a beginning, a new beginning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.